Hi, we're out on the range today, so please bear with gunfire you hear in the background, but fair warning, just about all I'm going to do today is talk. Now, I've got an array of the premium or boutique or what I'd call hyper ammunition, and over here I've got a selection of the typical off-the-shelf regular ammunition, and if you've seen very much of my work, you've seen me compare these two genres for power, accuracy, a couple of other things. And although there are some exceptions, I am generally not a fan of the hyper ammunitions. Quite a few people have asked me why. The answer I usually give is that to give an in-depth explanation of why I do not like hyper ammunition would take an hour. Recently, some people have told me they'd like to hear the hour-long version, so here we are. Be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. This comes with a litany of caveats. The first one being that I have a disdain for lecture and you're going to have to put up with my Shatner-esque pauses and my very annoying habit of tripping over words and transposing syllables and letters. Side note, although I like to keep these presentations family friendly, they are really made for adults. So if you're a grade schooler that has nothing better to do than make fun of me because when I try to say words like barrel, it sometimes comes out as burl, then perhaps you should watch something more in tune with your intellectual development, like romper room. But to get back on task, everything I'm going to say today are my conclusions and my opinions. My opinions are based on my training, my education, and my experience. Different people have different experiences, so they have different opinions. I make no claim that my opinion has its origin in the mind of greatness. And if someone does make that claim, it should severely strain your credulity. Another very big caveat is that as we go along, there are going to be some punchlines that come along later. There are going to be some yabbits. So if you turn this off in the next couple of minutes because you're bored, fair enough. But before you send me any hate mail telling me how much you disagree with me or how wrong I am, you really do have to watch the whole thing. There are some exceptions and some punchlines coming. So all of that having been said, let's get started. There are seven reasons why I dislike hyper ammunition. Number one is the cost. Now here I've got some regular ammunition, and here's a couple of boxes of what I'd call hyper ammunition. All of these are 9x19, all of them are 115 grain projectiles, and they're all hollow points except this one, which is an FTX projectile, like a ballistic tip. Now in terms of cost, I paid $22 for this, $21 for this, $24.50 for this. It's more money. And remember, this is a box of 25 rounds. These are boxes of 50 rounds. It's over twice as expensive. This box I only paid 16 for, but it's only a box of 20 rounds. Prices may vary in different areas, and the disparaging amount of difference between this genre and this genre can be quite a bit, depending on what type of ammo you're talking about. But this is a good example of how this type of ammunition can cost over twice as much. It certainly isn't twice as accurate or twice as powerful. Obviously, I'm being hyperbolic, but you get the point. It's a lot more expensive, and in a bang for your buck sense, it's exorbitant. Well, right now, some of you are thinking that it's not really intended that you're just going to go out and target shoot with it. It's intended to be carried, used only for serious shooting, and then when the time comes to trade out your ammunition, you're going to trade it out or just shoot it up. And that is a very good point. And that's one of those yabbits that we're going to come back to in a few minutes. Point two on my list is sometimes this ammunition has problems with accuracy. Wait a minute, it's supposed to have higher levels of quality control and be more accurate. Let me show you what I mean. Now I've got two reactionary targets and my Beretta Model 92 FS caliber 9x19. And I'll shoot these from 15 yards with two different types of ammunition. The sights on this pistol are only partially adjustable. I can hit the rear sight with a mallet and adjust for windage, but I cannot adjust for elevation. The ammunition I used to zero it was Remington Green and White Box 115 grain jacket at hollow point, but that's not the ammunition I'm shooting today. At the upper target, I shot Winchester White Box 115 grain jacket at hollow point. And although the group isn't all that great, you can still see that it's centered. 
This pistol can shoot a wide variety of 9mm ammunition with only minimal variation from the original zeroing. So what happened with the lower target? I was shooting this Novex Engagement Extreme Self-Defense Ammunition. It has a 65 grain projectile, which is far enough outside the parameters of what would be considered typical for 9mm ammunition that you can see that it changes our point of impact significantly. Even though I did get a pretty good group with it, it's still not hitting where the other ammunition hits. And this type of ammunition is expensive enough that for most people it's going to be cost prohibitive to use it as both a carry and practice ammunition. Most people are going to need a less expensive practice ammunition. And it does you no good if your carry ammunition and your practice ammunition don't hit in the same place. So when I say failures in accuracy, I don't necessarily mean your groups are going to get bigger. I mean that your carry ammo might not hit in the same place as your practice ammo. However, with the right combination of ammunition and gun, or perhaps the wrong combination, sometimes you will see larger groups. And right now some of you are thinking, that's an easy fix. If you try a type of ammunition that doesn't work, try another. And by the time you've gone through two or three, you are almost certainly going to find something that works for you. And that is a very good point. And it's one of those yabbits that we're going to come back to. Now point three on my list are failures of reliability. And when I say failures of reliability, I do not mean that when your hammer falls and your firing pin strikes the primer that the round fails to go off. What I'm talking about is the failure of this ammunition to reliably cycle in auto-loading pistols. Let me show you a close-up of some of this ammo. Now here's a few types of 9x19 ammunition. On your left is a typical 115 grain full metal jacket round nose. And here's two of what I'd call regular ammunition that are both 115 grain jacketed hollow points. And you can see that they're still fairly rounded in their projectile appearance. Here's three types of hyper ammunition. This is your guard dog 105 grain flat nose. Here's your RIP ammunition with its radically invasive projectile hollow point. And here's the Novex Engagement Extreme Self-Defense 9mm round with its 65 grain projectile. So with some types of this hyper ammunition based on the weight of the projectile or the shape of the projectile, they can be far enough outside the parameters of what would be considered typical that some types of ammunition in some guns can cause some problems with reliability. And a lot of you are thinking, that's an easy fix. You can test accuracy and reliability at the same time. And if you try a type of ammunition and it doesn't work, try something else. And by the time you've gone through two or maybe three types of ammo, you're going to find something that works for you. And again, that's a very good point. And again, it's one of those yabbits that we're going to come back to. Now, number four on my list is availability. A lot of gun stores don't stock all this different type of ammunition. They're just going to have a few. And a lot of times they only have a couple of boxes of it on hand because they don't really sell that much volume of it. So when it comes time to trade out your ammunition and you go to the store to buy a box of whatever, only to find out that that morning somebody bought the last box of it, you're kind of stuck. Also, some types are not really available in some areas. This guard dog ammunition, people tell me that it's at the stores all over the place, not any stores that I've been to in the part of country that I live in. So, sometimes there are problems with availability of this type of ammo. Mail ordering it can, to some degree, alleviate that problem, but availability can still be a problem. Now, you've heard me talk about trading out your ammunition. The idea is that as ammunition gets old and it's been exposed to hot and cold weather and moisture, that it can become less reliable. And that's a very good point. And you should trade out your carry ammunition every so often. It's a matter of a great deal of debate how often you should trade out your ammunition. And there's a lot of different opinions on that. Let me show you something. This is my Beretta Model 3032 Tomcat, caliber 32 ACP, and I've got it loaded with Winchester White Box 32 ACP 71 grain full metal jacket round nose. Let's see how it does. Now give me a second to reload my magazines, and we'll shoot some more. Now let's try two more magazines. Hey, 
and give me a minute to reload my magazines again. And this time I'll only shoot six rounds because that's all that was left in that box. Now there's something very interesting about this ammunition. I fired 34 rounds of this ammo because that's all that was left in the box. But what makes this ammo special is that I acquired it in the early 1990s. It's about 25 years old. And you saw that it functioned flawlessly. I wouldn't hesitate a minute to carry 25 year old ammo if it had been stored under ideal conditions, which this has in a cool, dry place. But the conditions under which your carry ammunition are stored are anything but ideal. You're carrying the gun on your person, exposed to your heat, your moisture. You're out in the weather, in the hot, the cold, the rain, the humidity. Sometimes you'll go places where you can't take your gun, so the gun and the ammo are left in the car when it's 110 degrees, or left in the car when it's 10 degrees. When people go to the range, they will empty their magazines of their carry ammunition to load in their practice ammunition. So a lot of times this stuff gets cycled through magazines or cycled through the chamber of a pistol quite a few times before you trade it out. These are not ideal conditions. So how often should you trade out your ammo? Some people will say every three months. I think that's excessive. I think a good rule of thumb is once a year. Perhaps less often, maybe once every two years if you work in an air-conditioned office, maybe a little more often if you work outside and you're constantly exposed to the weather. The only person that can decide what's right for you is you. But I think a good rule of thumb is once a year. So what does this have to do with the reasons why I dislike hyperammunition? Point five on my list requires my ring. Now this ring has elfin writing on it. And if I read this correctly, it reads, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. It's the Lord of the Rings ring. And yes, when I put it on, you can still see me. But this ring is also called the precious. And that is point five on my list, is the precious factor. Because of the cost, and sometimes problems with availability, this ammunition becomes so precious that people won't do the testing as far as accuracy and reliability that they need to do. They won't trade it out once a year. They'll carry this ammunition for 10 years, 20 years, and they're still using it, never having tested it, not really using it, just carrying it. And they don't test it because it is so precious. Now that might sound ridiculous, this is the part where I have to give the speech about the difference between the things we should do and the things we really do. Well, I give the long version of that speech in a presentation on spring compression, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But the short version is, life is full of things we should do that we don't really do. And one of the things that happens with this type of ammunition is they don't get tested for accuracy, don't get tested for reliability, and they are carried far longer than they should be because they are so precious. Now that might sound ridiculous, but this is the part of the presentation where I tell you a few anecdotes to illustrate my point. A friend of mine decided he wanted to carry Glazer safety slugs. Well, Glazer safety slugs are very expensive. At that time they came in a package of six rounds, which usually cost more than a box of 50 rounds of common ammo. And so he got a few of these and he carried them and I gave him the speech about because of the way they're designed, they're outside the parameters of what would be considered typical, he's really got to test them. And I think he fired two shots as part of his testing process. And he carried this stuff for seven or eight years. And when he finally traded it out, it wasn't because it was old, he just decided he had better options. And he still didn't shoot up the ammo or get rid of it, he just put it in a box and put it on a shelf. And to the best of my knowledge, he still has it over 20 years later because it's so precious. Another friend of mine, he was going through a divorce, so he was between permanent residences, so I was storing some guns and ammo for him. And in all of his stuff, I found a box of ammo that looked exactly like this one. Now his was 45, this is nine millimeter, but other than that, it was exactly like this. And I got to looking at this stuff, and it was all high performance ammunition. And there was about 48 rounds in the box. And as near as I could tell, it represented eight different types of ammunition. What he had done is he bought a box of whatever type of hyper ammo and then carried it for two, five, eight years. And over that time he would lose around here or damage around there or 
shoot a couple of shots, not in any life or death situation, just an impromptu shooting. And so the 20 round box that he had became six or eight rounds. So he'd go to the store and buy another box of ammunition, just whatever was available. And then that process would start over again. So we had a whole bunch of different types of ammunition in this box. Well, I thought this would be a good opportunity for some testing. So I took one of my 1911 platform handguns, and for every type of ammo where he had over five rounds, I took it out and shot it. I shot a target with five five-shot groups, and I had five really good groups in five totally separate, distinct, different places on the target. Even if he had tried to shoot up this ammunition, he couldn't have counted on any of it to hit in the same place beyond five or six rounds. And he had carried all this ammo for all this time, never having tested any of it, except in impromptu shooting one shot at a soda jug here or there. In this box of ammo, I actually noticed a particular type of ammo that's really hard to obtain, but I had gotten some, and I had given it to him over 20 years before, and he still had it. And he had this muckily done box of ammo because this genre of ammunition is so precious. Now let me tell you one more anecdote, and this is a Joe story. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, yes, Joe is a very real person. I just changed his name. Also in telling this story, some people erroneously infer that I'm saying that the ammunition in question was a poor quality ammo. That's not what I'm saying at all. So I'm going to change the name of the ammunition too, just so I don't inadvertently cast dispersions on anyone. Joe mail ordered this particular type of 9mm ammunition. And again, it was outside the parameters of what would be considered typical, and I'm giving him the speech about testing it. He assured me that he didn't need to test it because he knew that it was, quote, good ammo. Well, I'm sure it was, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to function reliably or shoot accurately in his individual handgun. But he didn't think he needed to test that. And he carried this stuff for years. And there was a time when we were out in the field and I did some impromptu target shooting and I was shooting something that was against a dirt bank and I said to him, hey Joe, see if you can hit that. And he tells me he doesn't want to shoot that. Why not? Because I'm loaded with my Hurtenberger Buscadero Ticondas and I don't want to shoot my Ticondas. On another occasion, we went jackrabbit hunting. Now, we get in the vehicle and our rifles are in the back. We have our handguns on us. We drive about 10 miles out of town, park in the sagebrush. As soon as we got out of the car, a jackrabbit comes loping by, as close to a walk as a jackrabbit can manage. And Joe aims his pistol at this rabbit, and he aims, and he aims, and he aims. And finally, the rabbit wanders off into the bushes, and uh, Joe, what were you waiting for? I didn't want to shoot it. Obviously, why not? Because I'm loaded with my Hurtenberger Buscadero Ticondas, and I don't want to shoot my Ticondas. Well, he then explained to me that he only brought that ammunition because he anticipated hunting with our rifles, and he figured he ought to bring the Ticondas just in case we ran into the boogeyman in the 10 miles between town and where we went rabbit hunting. And of course, you can't shoot a boogeyman with the ammunition you'd use for rabbit hunting. Now, there are times when I say I could bore you for an hour about whatever. I could bore you for an hour with just stories about this type of problem with hyper ammunition. I could probably bore you for half an hour just with stories about Joe and the Buscadero Ticondas. But what really got me worried about that was that he's training himself not to shoot. There's going to come a time where he really needs to shoot, and when he does, instead of thinking about sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, threat assessment, collateral damage, he's going to be thinking, do I really want to shoot my Ticondas? This is a problem with this genre of ammunition. And these problems occur because it becomes so precious. Now, before we go on to point six and seven, let's have an intermission. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.
most delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Well, if you didn't sneak out during the intermission, that was impressive. But let me get to point six, which is what I call legendary status. Now, there are events in history, or more often people in history, that really existed and really did things, but their story gets told and retold so many times and it becomes so fictionalized that they take on legendary status. A good example is Abraham Lincoln. He was certainly a real person. Many people would consider Abraham Lincoln a great man who did great things. But I doubt very much that he ever really hunted vampires. Legendary status. Hyperammunition takes on legendary status. It never ceases to amaze me the characteristics and capabilities that people attribute to this ammunition that it just doesn't have. Or even if it does have that characteristic, it has it to a much smaller degree than people claim it does. And even when it has such characteristics, they're not necessarily advantages. One is the topic of muzzle flash. People will make the blanket statement that hyperammunition is better than regular because it has less muzzle flash. Well, we have a presentation on that topic, and I found that some types of hyperammunition do have a lot less muzzle flash. But again, the blanket statement is only partially true. And even if it has less muzzle flash, is that really an advantage? Well, a lot of muzzle flash can give away your position. But in citizen-involved shootings, the people are usually pretty close together, and giving away your position is just not part of what's going on. There's also the concept of a lot of muzzle flash can rob you of your night vision, at least temporarily. That is also quite often not part of what's going on. And even if it can rob you of your night vision, if I'm pointing my pistol at my adversary and there's a lot of muzzle flash, I'm pretty sure he's getting the worst end of that deal than I am. There's also a technique for low light level shooting called flash firing, and we have a presentation on that too if you'd like to watch it. But it's based on the idea that when you fire your pistol, the muzzle flash will illuminate your sights for just a fraction of a second, allowing you to see them and adjust. With enough practice, it can be very effective. But it becomes far more difficult to do if you don't have at least some muzzle flash. So again, we have the blanket statement that's only partially true, and even if it is true, it's debatable if it's really advantageous. Another example is people will say, Hyper ammo is better than regular ammunition because it has nickel plated casings, regular ammo doesn't, nickel plating is more resistant to corrosion. Well, it is true, nickel plated casings are more resistant to corrosion, but is that really an advantage? I've found that even under the most adverse field conditions, I've never really had a problem with corrosion in just straight brass casings. And again, the blanket statement is not necessarily true, or at least only partially so. A lot of these do have nickel plated casings, but here's Zombie Max ammunition. It has straight brass casing, and if Zombie Max isn't hype, what is? Here's some Remington green and white box. This is about as regular as regular ammo gets, but in some calibers like this 38 Super ammo, it has nickel plated casings. So again, the blanket statement is only partially true, and I could go on and on about many other subjects on this particular concept. But one of the reasons I dislike this ammunition is its legendary status, and people tend to hype this stuff up more than it's already hyped. Point seven on my list is a subject I do not like talking about. It causes me a great deal of discomfort to talk about this particular subject. However, I think the information is more important than my comfort level. One of the reasons I do not like talking about this subject is because there's some guy with a shaved head and a beard and a foul mouth who likes to go on about how you have no right to disagree with him because you haven't seen what he's seen or some whatever it is he says. This subject puts me in a position where I have to at least in part agree with that guy, something I do not like doing. Remember that everything I'm about to tell you are my opinions. My opinions are based on my experiences. If you dissent from my opinion, I would have to ask you on what experience is your opinion based. That having been said, what I'm talking about is 
the effect that hyperammunition can have on criminal profiling. As a citizen with a concealed handgun license, or if you don't even have a license, you just have a firearm in your place of business or in your home, if you're put in the position where you have to use that, your actions will be very closely scrutinized. And things that you think wouldn't or think shouldn't have any bearing on the case quite often have a great deal of bearing on the case. Things like your hairstyle, how much melanin is in your skin, whether or not you have earrings, your fashion choices, what kind of car you drive, the list goes on. These things on a conscious or subconscious level can affect how law enforcement officials interpret the real evidence. Things like how many shots did you fire or how far you were from the target, that list goes on ad infinitum. Police officers tout themselves as highly trained professionals, and more often than not they are. When they come into a situation, they bring their training, their education, their wisdom, their altruism. But they're also human beings. And when they come into a situation, they bring their lack of training, their ignorance, their prejudices, their bigotries, and sometimes their political agendas. Also remember that when a police officer comes into a scene where there's been a shooting, the first thing he knows is someone got shot and you shot him. Everything he does starts from that line. You got to keep that in mind. And all of those things about you will affect, sometimes on a subconscious level, how he interprets the real evidence. And your firearms and ammunition choices are absolutely part of that. Let me show you a type of ammo. This is Winchester white box ammunition. In most calibers I've found it to give very satisfactory performance. It's high quality, low cost, and in selecting ammunition for concealed carry, you're talking about personal protection. It's easy to explain why you chose this because it reads personal protection right on the box. You might have a little more difficulty explaining something like this RIP ammunition. Rest in peace, like you really wanted to kill somebody. And it comes in this box that's kind of decorated with a tombstone motif. It also has the declaration on here that RIP actually stands for radically invasive projectile. Sounds like the title of a porno movie. This is the kind of thing that is going to cause you to get looked at with a very jaundiced eye. It's going to affect, either consciously or subconsciously, the way law enforcement officials, both the police and the district attorney, interpret other evidence. Right about now is when someone says the DA can't go into court and argue that you're guilty of a crime because of the ammunition you carried, as long as that ammunition was legal in your jurisdiction. And if he did argue that, a good defense attorney could shred his case. I've had quite a few people tell me that, and I can only say in reply that I dissent from that opinion. I've seen personally with my own eyes a court case where someone didn't have to fire a shot, but he'd used a gun to fend off some criminals. And the district attorney was arguing before the judge that this man was guilty because, quote, most people don't go around carrying two guns. Well, you tell me the district attorney can't make that argument. He did, and you can't unring that bell. And the idea that a good defense attorney could shred that argument, that presupposes that you had the fifty, seventy-five hundred thousand dollars to hire a good defense attorney. And even if you prevail in the court, you still kind of lost because you still have an arrest record that even though you can have it expunged, it's always still kind of there. And because you had to spend the fifty, seventy-five hundred thousand dollars to make the truth come out. And things like your hairstyle and your firearms and ammunition choices do affect all of that. Well, right about now is when someone says the way to avoid this unfair scrutiny on your ammunition choices is to figure out what kind of firearm and what kind of ammunition your local police use and then carry that. Now, that sounds logical. And let me say again, I dissent from that opinion. Here's a book on criminal profiling, written by a retired FBI agent named John Douglas and co-written by Mark Olshaker. John Douglas and his crew, primarily his partner Roy Hazelwood, they pretty much created, pretty much invented modern criminal profiling as we know it today. And some of my crew are current or retired police officers. One of my crew who is a retired police officer actually got to attend a seminar conducted by Roy Hazelwood. I personally have read four of Douglas's books, so I'm fairly familiar with the material. 
I can tell you that throughout the United States, all police officers receive some kind of training and education. How much they receive can vary a great deal from one jurisdiction to another. What subjects they're trained on can also vary a great deal. But for the police officers that I've worked with, they have all received training on things like criminal profiling. And part of that is training on the idea that it is a sign of criminal behavior, of antisocial behavior. It's a sign that you're a serial killer if you have a weird fascination with police equipment and police work. Douglas in his books mentions many times over that serial killers like to drive retired police cars that they got at auction or at least drive the same make and model as the local police. With that in mind, imagine the way they might interpret that piece of evidence if you have the same gun and ammunition they use when they've been trained that having the same things they have is a sign that you're some kind of kook. Something to think about. And so point seven on my list of why I dislike hyperammunition is the way it can affect how you are perceived by the police. So to recap, cost, accuracy, reliability, availability, the precious factor, legendary status, and criminal profiling. There are some exceptions. One exception is caliber 380 ACP. I've found that in typical off-the-shelf ammunition like the Winchester White Box or the Remington Green and White Box, it can provide good performance, but I have not found a regular ammunition in caliber 380 ACP that will provide good performance in the really short-barreled guns. For those, I will resort to a hyper ammunition, but in those cases, I think things like Sig Sauer Elite Performance and Hornady Critical Defense are better choices than RIP ammunition or Zombie Max. So if you've watched this entire presentation, thank you for your patience, and thanks for watching.